This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. The FPGA desktop is finished and I think it's a thing of beauty. Take a look. Yes, we've come a long, long way since part one. It's completely finished inside and out. The buttons are working, the lights are working. We've got some added extras on the front here, which I'll take you through. I think you're really going to like this. And it really is a conversation piece. It's created a huge amount of engagement in the first video in this series. Some of you calling me an idiot because you didn't like the way I'd done things. Some of you saying that this is amazing and you absolutely love it. There were no wrong opinions in there because what I'm setting out to create here is a machine that I really want. This is for me. Yes, I want to share it with other people, but this is for me. This is my ultimate machine, my ultimate FPGA based machine. And I love it. And that's all that matters to me here. And in your heads, you're thinking, well, what would I love? What, what would I do with a mister? For some of you, it was this. For some of you, it was strapping the mister to a back of a flat screen monitor so that you couldn't see it. And you think using a case like this is a complete waste of time. That's fine as well. If you come out of this series having watched it and you've learned how to hook up a light or hook up a power button for your own projects, then we've all gained, haven't we? Idiot or not, I'll take that on the chin. <laughs> uh, it's got a name now. It's got a name. This is the Mr. Fusion. Why? Because it takes you back to the future, of course. It's got a Mr. in there and it's a Fusion. It's got a strap line under there which says Checkmate Emulation. It's a fusion with the Checkmate case, this beautiful Checkmate 1500 Plus case. There's not many left now. Stephen Jones has got the last of his stock up for sale. When it's gone, it's gone. So Checkmate1500plus.com if you want to get this in black or white. It's your last chance. He won't be producing anymore. So Mr. Fusion Checkmate Emulation because people hate it when you call FPGA emulation. Oh, it gets people's backs up. But am I saying that this is emulation or am I saying... Checkmate emulation. I think that's what I'm saying. Emulation has met its match. Many puns in that sticker. <laughs> I hope you like the choice of name. So let's give you a tour of all of the changes inside and out that have happened on this machine. We'll start over here then with the power button, which works exactly as you would expect it to. And uh, if we take a look inside, I'll explain how that works. So here's where we got to then, and the next problem is the power switch up here. A cable familiar to anyone who's ever put a PC together. So how do we get this to connect up to this? Right, I've had a read up and I can't find any kind of power switching capability. You turn the power on and it turns on, you turn it off at the wall and it turns off. So I need to put this switch somewhere in line with the power cable as it comes in before it gets to the board itself. So how do we achieve that with just a momentary push button? Let me just demonstrate to you what I mean by momentary. I'm sure most of you know, but it's always good to see it in action. Okay, I've got the multimeter wired up to the switch and this is a momentary push button. So when I press it, you don't hear anything on the continuity when I hold it. You can hear it's beeping then because it, the circuit is closed and held closed because I'm holding the button in. When you press it, you do just get a little flick on the multimeter to show that the circuit closed momentarily. So how do we convert that momentary push into keeping the power flowing through the cable at all times? And I might have a little device to help us with that. And it's this little board here. No doubt you could knock something up yourself if you're an electronics whiz, but if you want to buy something quickly off the shelf, this is cheap and cheerful and it seems to do the job, I hope. You have pins or holes for your power in, so we'll solder in there. 
power out, so the power flows through it, and then we'll add a, a header and a couple of header pins down here into which we'll plug our button, and that will convert the momentary press into having the power constantly flowing through. And when we momentarily press it again, it will kill the power, and that should achieve what we need to. Let's solder it up and see if it works. Measuring nothing on the multimeter. Let's press the power button. Pretty much five volts. And no episode is complete without a bit of hot glue. Next we'll move on to the buttons here and the lights. The buttons are working. We've got the reset button for the overall system. So you press that and it resets the whole thing. We'll just wait for that to come back up. The second button is the menu. So when you're in a call, you might press that to change the game. And then when you're in the call, the third button um, doesn't do anything here, but it will reset that call. It will reset the machine that you're in without resetting the whole thing. Very useful to have. There's no reason why you can't do that with the keyboard. Everything is accessible on the keyboard. But I found as soon as I started bringing buttons into the mix, it plays with the old brain. It makes the whole thing, that, that tactile feel of pressing a button, makes the whole thing feel a little bit more real, if you like. And that's what I'm trying to achieve here. I'm trying to fool myself into thinking I'm playing on these original machines. And if a button is what it takes to make it a bit more convincing, then so be it. So that's why I've added buttons, entirely optional, but they're there and they're working. Now to get these hooked up, you look at the board inside, you can see that there are these two rows of headers. One is for the lights and one is for the buttons. Now the buttons were really quite easy. I just crimped up some cables, put the connector on, plugged it in, and then at the other end where the buttons are, I daisy chained the ground through all of the buttons and then one wire to each button. There was one spare pin on that connector, I don't know what that was for, but uh, just three cables and the ground and your buttons are all up and working. Now, if we move on to the lights here, you can see I've loaded up the Sega Mega CD core because it's seeking, it's looking for a CD to load. So it's flashing that drive light. So you can see that that's working as well as the power light. And while we're in here, I'll just flick the music up. There you go. You can hear the music is working on my Goodman's Active 75 speakers, which I've paired up. Let's turn that down again. I picked these up for £10 on eBay and I think they're brilliant. Anyway, back to the lights. These were not quite as simple as the buttons because although you've got that plug on the board that you can plug into that's labelled up for the lights, it was a little bit trickier. See, when I put the multimeter on that, I was finding that the pin for each light was only given out about 1.7 volts when it was on full. Whereas the lights on the board itself, the existing lights, were getting 3.3 volts. So I wanted to use the Checkmate LEDs here and they need a good three volts to light up. 1.7 just wasn't enough. So the power light was easy. Pin one here uh, and pin two, that's your ground, and that is a 3.3 volt that just comes on, on for in full when the system's turned on. So it doesn't matter that it's not technically the power light if the system's on, the system's on, right? So that's fine. I just hooked it up to that. When it came to the drive light, instead of using that connector, I just soldered a wire onto the underside of the existing drive light that's on the board where it was getting 3.3 volts. So it was getting a boost somewhere before it got to there. So uh, that's working now. I did manage in the process to accidentally hook it up to the other end of the connector where five volts is coming out. Yeah, of course that blew the LED. So the yellow Checkmate LED is blown. And as a temporary fix, I've hooked up these tiny little red LEDs and just tucked them behind so you've still got the flush LED lights on the case. So from the outside it doesn't look bad, from the inside it's looking a little bit wonky and as soon as I've got the correct little square LEDs to replace that, we'll get that flush again and we'll get it looking right. But it's working, okay, from the outside. 3.3 volts and we're away. So that's our lights and that's our buttons working and there is one more thing on the front which I really like. Take a little look at this. 
So to demonstrate this, I've got the Commodore 64 core loaded and Spy Hunter. Now it's all very well being able to plug in a Xbox 360 controller into the USB port at the back or something newer. Yeah, that works, that's nice. But wouldn't it be nice if you could grab your old Competition Pro or your Monster Joystick Mini and plug it straight into a good old fashioned DE9 port. So that's what I've got under these dust caps, which I've 3D printed. You can just plug straight in with your old style joystick. There we go. And start playing. Again, it adds to the illusion that this is somehow real hardware, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying, uh, that it's somehow genuine. I know we're rewriting history because something like this didn't actually exist back in the day, but it feels more real. And I really like the fact that we've got these two ports here. So two players simultaneously. And if we take a look inside, what that actually is, is a new product from monsterjoysticks.com. And quite simply, it just takes what you plug into it, converts it through that micro USB port, and then you plug it into your USB hub, and it just works. It's glorious. It supports six button Sega Mega Drive or Genesis sticks. It supports the Amiga CD32 pad, thanks to a recent firmware update from monsterjoysticks.com. You just flick that little switch on the side, and that allows you to reprogram it with the latest firmware. Really nice, less than a tenner, so I've got two of them. And the only modification I did to them was I just hacksawed off a little bit of the plastic at the top there so I could get this really nice flush finish to the case. I know some of you won't like that. Some of you will say, well, why didn't you put USB ports in the front? Again, this is what I want. This is my build. It wouldn't be wrong to put USB ports. You could get a five and a quarter inch drive bay a USB port hub that you put there and you could plug in six USB controllers if you wanted and play Bomberman or Dino Blaster or whatever you want with your mates. Fine, you can do that. But this is what I wanted and I really like this. Another common thing that I saw in the comments was you saying, why didn't you make the SD card accessible? Why don't you drill a hole in the front, put the SD card there, use a ribbon extension so that you can pop it out? Well, there's reasons for that. We've done this before on the previous Checkmate case in which I put the Vampire Amiga. You remember I installed just that, the ribbon extension cable, and I could just pop it out. Now I haven't done it on here because I found it's not strictly necessary. The SD card, for, for a start, you don't have to use the SD card. You can use that to get the initial boot up and then you can plug a USB drive in. So in the longer term, it might be that I use a higher capacity USB drive in there, in which case accessing the SD card doesn't help me. But more so, I've got a Wi-Fi dongle and you can see it's connected here by this little symbol to the Wi-Fi. And by default, the FTP server is enabled. I mean, underneath it's Linux, ultimately. So you can get into it remotely by SSH. You can set up a Samba share, but FTP is enabled by default. So I can just FTP into it and I can drag and drop the games and the calls that I want on there. More so again, if we look in the scripts folder, because this thing is online, you can go to the update script. It goes out to GitHub. It checks for any updates and it just pulls them in if there are any updates. So it's not strictly necessary to have to access that SD card uh, as long as you've got it online. The Wi-Fi dongle was six pounds. I think it was six pounds 95, in fact, really, really cheap. So um, I might come back to that and do it at some point, but I'm happy with how it's set up now. And speaking of USB, there was a lot of feedback in the comments about why don't you use a powered USB hub? That would be more useful. And you know what, as soon as I introduced two extra USB devices, which was the DE9 joystick port. Of course, I'd immediately run out of ports. So I did need to up that and I did go for a powered uh, USB hat. So there's an official sort of Mr. USB hat that you can get that sits onto the stack. So here it is, I've added it to my stack. It's powered. So I've just to pass the power through from the DC jack on the IO board down to the uh, USB board. So now I've got, um, I think it's eight extra USB ports on there, which is enough for the Wi-Fi. It's enough for the ports on the front and it still keeps my four USB ports on the back active with room to spare. So yeah, that was a sensible upgrade to make. And also it makes everything so much tidier in the case. I've got less going on with that external USB hub that I had before that's ripped out. So that was a nice little improvement. Let's take a look at the back now because I've done a few things to uh, blank off the, uh, the back of it. And you're probably wondering, where's the mouse, some of you? Well, let me take you to the mouse house and show you. Here we are around the back of the machine. Now I pitched this idea of a, a mouse house in part one and you guys really took to it. You really like that idea. So that's what I've done. I've 3D printed where the PSU normally would be in this case, a little mouse house. There you go, isn't that cute? 
Now the rest of it is just blanking plates, if you like. It's, it's basically 2D, 3D printing. It's just rectangles. And as many of you pointed out, you don't need to 3D print that. I mean, I've done it A, because I'm trying to teach myself as much 3D printing as possible. Uh, so any excuse to use it, I'll, I'll take that excuse. And B, because I had the gray filament. So I think the gray looks quite nice in contrast to the black. But you could use a piece of metal. If you've got CNC, um, access to CNC facilities, then brilliant. You could cut a perfect shaped uh, piece of metal and screw it in. A piece of plastic, just cut it. A piece of wood, just cut it. You don't need to 3D print. I fully accept that and I'm not pretending it's any different. But it was nice to use the 3D printer at least for the mouse house or whatever you want to hide in there. So this is all blanked off, which is just a finishing touch. It's not strictly necessary. We've got the audio jack still here. I mentioned in part one that that was snug and it wouldn't pop out. I have put some hot glue on it just to give it some extra security. So that's still in there working nicely. Everything else really remains the same, but probably the most important upgrade of the whole build, right? A mouse house. In you go. <laughs> and you'll have noticed, as I've shown you various clips inside the case, that uh, there was no shortage of hot glue in there. Yes, I've used it liberally to put everything together, but once that lid's back on, you don't really notice. If you wanted to get a better finish, yes, there are many ways of doing that. So uh, this is my build. This is how it's ended up. I'm really happy with it. So a very quick overview then. Here we are in the main menu. Now this isn't gonna cover everything that's changed in the last year because so much has changed. It's just a few things that I've noticed to give you a feel for the system, give you a feel for what's changed. We'll start in arcades and there are so many more arcade cores than we had before. In fact, I've got a few duplicates in there for some reason. But there, is, there are loads more. We've got Bionic Commando. Um, what else have we got? Regular Commando. <laughs> Demolition Derby. Uh, Mario. Mario Brothers is a new one. But the real, the real big one that came out recently was support for the CPS arcades, including, if I go to S, we should find in here Street Fighter 2. And we'll just let that load up. Now the beauty of this setup is that it's outputting both to VGA and HDMI at exactly the same time. So um, it's, it's the perfect stream setup. I can play on the CRT while it's capturing or streaming out the HDMI, which I love. Here we are, let's put some money in. My screen's a little bit off, I'll need to center that. There we go. I'm playing with a with a two button joystick, <laughs> so don't expect great things. Maybe I can I can get a few Hadoukens out, but you can see that's running beautifully. A really nice arcade accurate version of Street Fighter 2 because it is the arcade running in FPGA. Can we beat him with one button? Surely not. Yes, I am the Street Fighter champion. And if you like Street Fighter 2, then no doubt you'll like. Street Fighter Zero, which is now supported on the Mister. And if, dare I say, it's looking too crisp for you on the CRT, we have got, if we go into the menu, effects that we can add. So we can add scan lines on the CRT. Let's go for 25%, just a subtle amount of scan lines, and that gives it a really nice authentic look. I'll just flick through some more of the arcade games so you can see what's actually in the list. Uh, there's so many more than a year ago. We've got Double Dragon there, Double Dragon 2, Flappy Bird. <laughs> We're not up to MAME levels of support yet, but the, the list is ever increasing. Really nice to see. We'll jump into the consoles, just speaking of arcade games, because a pretty significant, that's computers, Neil, consoles, a pretty significant addition to the cores is the Neo Geo core, which is working fantastically. I did upgrade the RAM, the little RAM module that I had to give myself enough RAM to use the Neo Geo. Uh, let's stick a ROM in.
It's a really nice call, this Neo Geo one. I absolutely love it. Metal Slug. So I haven't come across any slowdown at all other than that that you would have found on the original Neo Geo because it did slow down at points when it got busy. Uh, but it's but it's great, it works great. Let's flick through the list of consoles. There's lots that were there a year ago, but even the ones that are there have received a lot of updates. Um, I know we're in consoles, but over in the computers folder, the Atari ST, for example, has had six updates to its score since we made that original video a year ago loads and loads going on on each core. Um, the Mega CD is not one that I remember seeing a year ago. We've got the Jaguar there. Let's just take a quick look at the Mega CD. CD BIOS not found. I've obviously not tried this one. Uh, I need to get the CD BIOS file on there to try it out. Done. See, it's very quick to do this because I'm just going over to my PC, FTPing in and changing the files. So um, that's why I don't really need to access the SD card at this point. Okay, that's the US BIOS screen, version 1.1. Let's try this now. And we do have drive activity going on as the CD reads. Hey, it plays well, as you would expect. If it can do the Mega Drive well, then it should at least do the Mega CD well. But it certainly does it. Just love the way the Amiga runs on here. <laughs> I'm so rubbish at Tetris. And you thought I was bad at Tetris. Wait until you see me play this. Well, I made it to level two, so I did something, right? <laughs> it's not bad, is it? I'm really happy with how this has turned out. I know it's not to everyone's taste, as we discussed earlier, but I hope it's inspired you. And it has already inspired people like Gary Pinkett, who's a regular viewer, and after episode one, he rushed out to buy everything he needed for his Mr. setup, and he's putting it inside this Sharp X68000 expert case that he just happened to have. Do you know what? I think it might even look better than this once he's got that up and running. He's also managed to get hold of the same gateway monitor because 10 more of these appeared shortly after the first episode uh, from a guy based in Portugal who happens to be selling them uh, 10 more new old stock. So they've been flying off the shelves and Gary's managed to get himself one. So well done, Gary. It will be a sympathetic mod. Don't worry, he's not going to destroy that case. And it was already empty. And also Jake had already beaten me to this by putting a Mr. in a Checkmate case. His is a Cream Checkmate 1500 Plus case. It looks just as good in cream, I have to say. But he hadn't got the power button up and running. He was using an external switch like this. So I've sent him a spare PCB that I had, and I hope you get that up and running soon, Jake. And I'd love to see the finished item. Is this project now finished for me? I'm going to say yes. There's plenty more that I could do, including adding more USB ports to the front and... Um, well, so much more, there's so much space in this case. You know, you could even put a Raspberry Pi in there and a KVM so that you could switch between the Mr. and the Raspberry Pi at the flick of a switch uh, and enjoy it that way. But I'm just gonna keep it like it is. I'm not gonna overcomplicate it anymore. And I'm happy with it this way. It is gonna get a permanent setup. It is gonna sit near the streaming PC and it's gonna feature plenty on the channel in future and on the live stream at the end of this month, RMC Live, where I'll take your suggestions and we'll see how well it does or doesn't perform with the games that you choose. I hope to see you there. Until then, give the video a thumbs up if you haven't already, or an Australian thumbs up. 
take a moment to subscribe and I hope to see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching. Take care. If you've enjoyed today's video and what I do here in general, then consider heading over to patreon.com forward slash retro man cave, where a small contribution will give you access to all videos one week early without any adverts, but most importantly, you'll become an official cave dweller. I hope to see you there and thank you. Thank you.